Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Brian Keane, best-selling author of the book, The Fitness Mindset and Rewire Your Mindset, here to help you by deconstructing expert guests on all things health, fitness and mindset. Today's guest is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. This is an absolute corker of a podcast. I would highly recommend you have a notepad and a pen and go back and potentially save this episode to listen to several times. There is just knowledge bombs left, right, and center in today's episode. For those of you unfamiliar with Dr. Balduzzi, he is a doctorate or holds a doctorate in naturopathic medicine, a former national champion bodybuilder, and holds dual degrees in nutrition and neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's the founder of the Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project. Today's episode, we dive into everything that you would need to know about changing body composition regardless of your age, regardless of your goal, whether that's losing body fat, building muscle, improving health, improving performance. Some of the topics we touched on in today's episode, falling prey to the fitness marketing messages out there and what to watch out for when it comes to quick fix solutions, uh, why fitness doesn't have to be complicated and based on your goal, you can reverse engineer a training program that works for you based on what you enjoy, behavioral psychology around food. We spend a large portion of today's episode talking about food, about the behaviors and nutritional principles and strategies that you can apply that is going to allow you and will allow you to stay on top of a long-term plan when it comes to nutrition. We also touch on circadian rhythm, sleep and fat loss, and how stress can impact your body, your health, and your body composition, whether it's good stress versus bad stress and the danger being in the dose. There is so much in today's episode. As I said, have a notepad and pen ready for this one and maybe even save it and go back and listen to it a couple of times. I loved the message. I love Anthony's content. For those of you who are following his YouTube channel, you know how much value that they put up on there. So definitely go check that out at the end of today's podcast. But without further ado, here's today's guest, Dr. Anthony Balduzzi on behavioral psychology around food, nutritional principles, and how poor sleep or too much stress negatively impacts fat loss. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm delighted to be joined today with my guest, Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. Dr. Balduzzi holds dual degrees in nutrition and neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania, a doctorate in naturopathic medicine, and is a former national champion bodybuilder. He is also founder of the Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project, online health and fitness communities aimed at empowering busy parents to get healthy, lose weight, and build muscle through practical nutrition and exercise plans. The YouTube videos have over 30 million views and over 300,000 subscribers on their channel. I'm looking forward to catching up on all things health and fitness in today's episode. Dr. Balduzzi, welcome to the podcast. Brian, thanks for having me. Man, I'm really looking forward to this chat. Before we dive in, because we have so many different things that we can cover today, talk to us a little bit about your backstory um, and kind of what got you involved, particularly with the Fit Father Project. You know, growing up, I I grew up in uh, the United States. My family was born in New York, and I had a, a regular childhood by most standards until my dad got very sick. When I was uh, around three, my dad, after years of basically just busting his butt to put food on the table for me, my mom, my little brother, he got diagnosed with terminal cancer and he ended up dying at 42 years young. And it really impressed me at a young age to see dad suffer and to see what he went through. And it taught me so many lessons. One of those was that health is the foundation of everything we love. Because as I saw my dad lose his health and die at such a young age, I saw him lose everything that mattered to him, his ability to provide for our family, his ability to pursue his passions and hobbies, his ability to spend time with me, my mom, my little brother, all of these things that he cared the most about rested upon his health and he lost his health and he lost that. So early on uh, in my life, I started having this rewiring happen in my brain where I'm like, health is super important and I need to learn everything that I wish my dad knew. So I started studying nutrition. I started exercising. You know, I, I eventually let me, led me into personal training and bodybuilding and, and culminating in medical school. And what I realized through all these, the, these learnings in this, this multi-decade experience of, of venturing into health and fitness is that health is the most important thing for many of us to focus on our lives, especially if we don't have it. Because when we elevate our health, all these other areas of our lives improve automatically. But particularly the other message is that right now in society, in culture and everything that's going on, we look around, it's very easy to not be healthy. 
Like it takes effort. You have to put effort in with the kinds of ways you move your body, effort with the kinds of foods you eat that they're they're good and healthy and nutritious, watching your sleep and not falling prey to marketing messaging of all sorts of kinds of things. So we have a, we have a society in a world right now that has made it hard for people to be healthy. And then you tack on 20 years, a slower metabolism, some joints that hurt, busy schedule with kids, and you find yourself a lot like my dad was. Middle of life, struggling, knowing he wants to do better, but not feeling like he has the motivation, the drive, the ability to do that. And for him, he paid the ultimate price. And so I was inspired to be like, how could I help guys like my dad who are in the midpoint of life who want to live healthy? So I started the Fit Father Project about 10 years ago, and we built it up from a slow blog into the company, the YouTube channel, the program, and, and all this amazing stuff. And we also created the Fit Mother Project. And I'm, I'm proud to do a little humble brag here is that we've helped over 40,000 people in over 100 countries in our programs. And these are busy moms and dads, primarily in their 40s, 50s, 60s, who are losing weight, building sustainable health and nutrition habits, learning how to move their bodies and, and, and just feel better, build age-defying muscle. Really, we're trying to take back the idea that at a certain age, you're over the hill and that fitness has to be complicated because a lot of us know the things we need to do. It's a matter of getting them into a system that we can be consistent with. So that's what we help people with. So I'm so passionate about doing. I wake up every day and I'm like, how can I help more people figure this health and fitness out for themselves? So this podcast and being on here with you is, is amazing as I know we share so much of this. I love that. And one of the things we said, Anthony, just before I went on air was I'm a big believer that my program works tremendously well for some people. But when I think of busy moms, busy dads, I'm like going through your content, consuming what you have. I'm like, this is a perfect fit for people who are struggling for time or for those. When I love this, particularly about the content on the YouTube channel, breaking down the misconceptions that older people tend to have when it comes to getting in shape. And just on that topic, when it comes to particularly, because I know you do a lot of work with busy moms, 35 plus, you know, busy fathers, 40 plus, as you mentioned in that bracket. But what are some of the biggest misconceptions you generally see when it comes to people getting in shape, especially older individuals? And not like, I'm not talking, you know, specific people in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. I'm talking the demographic you work with. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest misconception is that is, is in order of priority of what things you need to focus on when you're trying to improve your health. They're, they're unfortunately, because of a lot of marketing messaging and, and there's just a lot of money in fitness, we've been led to believe that to start losing weight, getting healthier, improving the way our bodies look and feel that we need to spend and invest extra time into exercise, time that we may not feel like we have right now on our schedule. I, I think it's a huge gap because you can hear like people want to start these fitness things, but like, man, I just don't have the time. When am I going to get it in? Am I have to get up at like an hour earlier? I already got up at 4 a.m. to get my kids ready for work and all this in, in school and all these things. The good news is that when it comes to making body composition changes, as your audience very well likely knows, nutrition is the key. We have clients who lose 80, 100 pounds without ever doing anything more than just walking. You know, they never touch a dumbbell or a treadmill or, the, or anything like that. They just walk and they follow a nutrition plan. So the cool thing about this is with a lot of our members, we get them on a nutrition plan that works for them. And I want to talk about the, our, our kind of philosophy and approach to this. And then they start losing three, four pounds in that first week without doing anything. And then you start to feel a little more confident, man, maybe next week I can do a little bit more. I feel a little better. Maybe I have a little more time back in my life because I have more energy. And then the process starts to build. It's a mistake ordering things the wrong way where you feel like you need to add something more in a high intensity workout and you haven't been working out in 10 years or you're, or, or, you know, and, and adding that on top of your schedule, not going to work for most people. So we, we order the right things on that note. Another thing that we're, we're huge proponents of that not enough people talk about is the importance of getting your circadian rhythm and your sleep right before you start any vigorous exercise program. You know, the fact that people aren't sleeping well is, is a huge epidemic and it, it affects certainly people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. We get less quality sleep as we age. It's kind of a byproduct of getting older. But you pair all the, the screens and the, the stressful lives that we have and it's happening to our kids, too. When your circadian rhythm's off, this whole hormonal cascade that helps uh, your metabolism work properly, um, you be insulin sensitive and all these things that are really important for health and weight loss, they get screwed up. And it's almost like the diet set that if you put, put two people on separate diets, one group's not sleeping well, the other group is, the group that's not sleeping well is going to be losing muscle tissue, they're not going to lose as much weight, and they're going to be more hungry all the time. So it's like we got to fix these foundational things before we need to jump to the new exercise gizmo and fat. And there are workouts that we suggest for people in their 40s, 50s, 60s that tend to be more joint friendly, time efficient. You can do them at home, involve some of these foundational movements that we need to stay strong at as we age, like shoulder pressing, hip hinging, squats, um, et cetera, like a lot of these, these foundational motions. 
Um, but I, I suppose the main misconception is the idea that you need to spend more time to exercise and that it, it needs to be this big investment where it can just be some tweaks with your nutrition that can start to clean things up for you. I'm definitely going to double back to the circadian rhythm and sleep because alongside nutrition being key, there's so much there to unpack. But you've mentioned twice there, Anthony, about marketing messages and people falling prey to marketing messages, especially within fitness. What are some of the examples of that that come to mind? Well, here's the deal. And and this is just going to be the honest, straight truth from my perspective. This whole fitness industry has been predicated on decades of people failing at losing weight. We have had commercial fitness around, let's just say, I mean, like I think bodybuilding in the United States early in like the 50s, 60s really started to bring fitness into this physical culture. And and look how far we've come now with like Instagram and fitness now versus maybe, you know, 30, 40 years ago where people thought lifting weights might be bad for you. Right. Um, so this progression, and we look at today, there are 50% of people over 40 who are overweight. So obviously this fitness culture is not creating a good solution. We've been getting fatter over the years, despite having trends of all these different diets. These marketers are in this industry and they're trying to sell the new shiny thing. At first it was like the Tony little gazelle or the, the Chuck Norris at home total body or the perfect push up gizmo or the new archer band resistance thing or the Peloton bike at this point. There are new solutions being marketed as this is the new shiny object that's going to help you. But that's obviously not the truth. The truth that's going to help you is developing a a system, a health system that's uniquely tailored to your schedule, to your food preferences, to the way you like to move your body so that it can be, you can be consistent because if you make consistent, good decisions over a period of time, we project that out, you win. And it's not a gizmo that's going to help you get there. But this is what we do. And we do the same thing with diets. Like, you know, diets come and go in these new ebbs because we want something to grab. The marketers want something to then to then pitch out when the foundations of really what it takes to have a healthy human body and to to heal it as well, to get it healthy, are not complicated. Uh, They're very ancestral. They're kind of just baked into the nature of how our bodies move, how connected we are to circadian rhythm, the fact that we need good water, sunshine, non-processed foods and some kind of daily movement. And, and sprinkle in some high intensity exercise and sprinkle in some loving connections and relationships. And you have a recipe for a beautiful, happy, healthy life. And we know this. We've studied the people who live the longest and the happiest, those pockets of centenarians. They're not doing P90X. They're not owning Bowflexes. They're gardening. They're eating non-processed foods. They're moving their bodies. And many of them that do more high intensity exercises as well, as well maintain more muscle mass. So like we can do this stuff. And I didn't probably say anything right there that was that was groundbreaking something someone didn't know here. It's just how do we manage our behaviors and create a system so we can be consistent? How do we stay motivated over the long haul? How do we create structures and accountability structures so that we we can stay on track and that little derails don't send us into 20, 30 pound tailspins like so many people do. So these are the things I'm passionate about because it's like, this is the forest where I think uh, oftentimes all the marketing messaging is focusing on individual trees, if you know what I mean there. 100% that's such an incredible message and I completely agree with everything you said but what jumped out at me there Anthony just for people listening is that advice even though I know you specialize working with older individuals that's the same advice for somebody that's 22 23 24 25 so how do you tailor that right I mean well the first off yes that's what it takes to sustain a healthy human body now with age what happens is the stakes go up the stakes go up they go up with your joints because you've probably accumulated wear, tear, injuries if you were an old athlete, sports-like stuff. So the exercise that you do needs to feel good on your body. So it might not be the same kind of exercise you did in your 20s and 30s. You may be doing some strength training, but exercises may be modified. You may be doing a lot of prehab, rehab kind of stuff to help strengthen and, and correct your posture, which is essential as you age. Your spinal health ultimately becomes the quality of your life. Or you may be doing something low intensity with your movement. So that's one thing that changes. The other thing that changes is uh, over the course of your 20s, 30s, 40s, most people lose some muscle mass. Most people have some declining levels of of hormonal support that's good for a healthy body composition. So lower testosterone levels in men, you know, the whole perimenopause, um, estrogen changes for women. um, And we have a loss of muscle mass, a a slowing metabolism. So nutrition needs to be more on point. You know, ask somebody in their 50s. And if they had the, if they were back in their 20s, they could eat a whole pizza, wake up the next day, feel a little leaner. But you do that in your 50s, you're going to feel bloated for two, three days. Digestive tract is a little more sluggish. 
these are natural changes that happen with the body as we age. There is a certain slowing down. But it doesn't have to be this drastic explosion of we're overweight, high blood pressure, pre-diabetes, diabetes, diabetes, and then we're just losing everything into this, this giant crash until the heart attack at 70. Like it doesn't have to be that. And so we need to tailor things so the nutrition is sustainable, um, still reasonable and balanced. People in their 50s aren't counting their macros as much. We certainly have clients that do, particularly if they want to build some muscle and they're pretty dialed in. But the kind of the, the nutrition rules and it can be a lot more simple and it doesn't need to be as complicated as giving people guidelines on what to eat. And, I, and I'd love to talk about that because I've been on every spectrum of this nutrition game from being a competitive bodybuilder and weighing every single bit of food that went in my body to being, you know, where I am now and, and learning a lot of these, these more fluid perspectives. So, I, you know, the program needs to be tailored, but the foundations are certainly the same. If someone's listening to this and they're a student, they're 16 years old. Drink water in the morning, get sunshine, move your body every single day, even if you're walking, you know, have positive friends and connections and eat mostly non-processed food. Your life will get better. You'll get smarter. You'll become more successful because this health stuff influences everything, as we kind of talked about in the beginning. Expand on those nutritional foundations. As you mentioned, drink the water, avoid the processed foods or minimize the processed foods, the stuff that hopefully at this point, especially people listening to this podcast have heard me drone on about and other people time and time again. When it comes to nutritional foundational principles, what else jumps to mind when you bring that up and what can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. So two, two ways to approach this, this great question, by the way, two ways to approach this. One is from a behavioral psychology perspective and one on from like a nutrition, what actually do we need in terms of like a nutrition ingredients uh, kind of perspective. Let's go from the psychology perspective first, behavioral psychology. So ultimately we all know what healthy foods are for the most part and what healthy foods aren't. There might be a little confusion from some people for the most part would probably know that eating something like the wild caught salmon is a better move than the burger or a piece of fruit is probably better than the processed thing that came in the box. So it's not a, it's not a matter of information. It's a matter of behaviors. And if we're going to eat, I think one of the first things we need to figure out is we're managing this health journey day by day. Like our awareness is fixed in this kind of present moment. And ultimately every day we're going to be putting stuff into our bodies. So how do we manage those choices better? The first thing we teach our clients is to get structure, like to figure out when you eat, because at the very least, if you start there, it's kind of like how the human body has a skeleton and the muscles hang on the skeleton. You need a skeleton to your schedule. And so if you can figure out your meal timing schedule setup that works for you, that's a first huge step because then we can kind of slot things in. And now you have a proactive structure instead of reactive or a lot of people who don't have a plan don't have the skeleton. They're just like, they're goopy. They're all over the place. They eat something, then they snack here, then they skip two meals and then they blow it out at in and out burger or someplace in the evening, these kinds of things. So we, we give our clients five different meal timing schedule setups that fit most people. Some are having breakfast in the morning. Some are intermittent fasting. Some are for people who might work the night shift or the third shift, but we help people find what's going to work for them because it makes it proactive. And then we help them standardize a couple of those meals. Because let's say you are eating three meals a day, seven meals per week. That's 21 meals. For someone who's struggling to eat healthy, that's 21 challenges. That's 21 decision points. That's 21 potential potholes you can, you can do. So what if we just removed the first third of those? What if we standardized your healthy breakfast every single morning that it's quick and convenient? Maybe it's overnight oats. Maybe it's some kind of egg recipe. Maybe it's some awesome protein smoothie with some superfoods. Whatever it is for you doesn't exactly matter. Notice I haven't told you what to eat. I've just told you what if we standardize this with a food that you like. Because the food that someone following a completely plant-based diet might be different than someone who wants to eat more paleo. Both people can apply this strategy though. Standardize that first meal. Make sure it's highly nutritious. It's easy to make under 10 minutes. And ideally you can make it uh, whether you're at home or not. So something that's kind of like ubiquitous and easy to get. So your routine's not as tied to a specific location, which is a vulnerability in the system. But you know, hey, this is a small thing, but a minor detail. Standardize that first meal. You've removed a third of those decision points. Um, the second meal of the day, and we'll get to like the hydration and other elements too, but the second meal, it's like try to get some green stuff into your body on that second meal in particular. This is important regardless of what your diet is because this digestive tract and these, these gut bacteria that we have, they love plant fiber. They love fiber from fruits. They love fiber from greens. Obviously, eat the foods that agree well with your body. But for sure, getting a bunch of like vegetables for some fiber in the middle of the day is only going to help keep you full. It's phenomenal for your digestive tract. It's good for your cholesterol levels. And you compare it with any kind of protein you love. And you could even get a salad with some chicken at a place like McDonald's. So, I mean, that's a certainly a better choice than a lot of other things that we, we could have. So I'm just trying to say with the extreme, you can, you can actually recreate this idea of protein and veggies in the afternoon very easily. 
Could be a sandwich though. We help our, our members, like we, we give people options. It's, and we're not in a camp of, we are a super, super ketogenic, low carb diet, or we're a super, super high carb diet, or we're only vegetarian or only this. We want to give people the options to build the system that works for them. So a lot of guys, they have sandwiches. Maybe they put it on some high quality sprouted bread with some turkey, whatever else they have on there. They love it. And then we, we, if, if people are not intermittent fasting, we recommend you get a standardized snacks too, you know, so you kind of take the thinking of it, out of it. And then dinner is all about variety. You could have meal prepped ahead of time and create something that you made there. You can order from a restaurant around you. You can have, uh, you know, healthy food you make at home. Like we give people recipes for sure. But the idea here is that you just have a healthy dinner and we want to balance this idea of being consistent with having variety. We, we need both. Like we love routine, but we also love the vacation. But when we're on the vacation for a whole year, eventually we're like, man, I want to go back to the routine. We need this consistency of variety or two levers of the human experience. We want to have both. And I, I think the weight to do it is like two thirds consistency, one third variety seems to work well for most people. And then we have people, you know, pre-plan and have a strategy for when they do like have free meals or, or stuff where they go out and eat something that's totally, you know, quote unquote off the plan, but it's not, it's on the plan. It's part of the plan. It's just the free meal part of the plan. And outside that, we're huge proponents of uh, morning hydration, you know, regardless of when you have your first meal, probably the most important thing you can do when you get up in the morning is rehydrate with ideally some trace minerals in there, some pink Himalayan sea salt, maybe some trace mineral drops, some high quality water. And ideally, if you can get some sunshine on your skin and your eyes, that helps in train a healthy circadian rhythm and take a little walk. That'd be a, a perfect scenario, in my opinion, for human health would be people get up, they rehydrate, uh, they take some deep breaths through their nose, they walk around a little bit to pump some blood and lymphatic fluid, and they get some sunshine on their skin for some vitamin D and sunshine in the eyes to kind of entrain that circadian rhythm. This is amazing. Like we don't talk enough about this in the fitness circles, but like the, the, the sunlight in the eyes in the morning actually triggers the brain to release serotonin that gets converted to melatonin later in the night. So like sunshine kind of makes you happy and it actually blunts that morning cortisol spike, which we want, but the sunshine actually decreases and smooths out that cortisol spike. So we're meant to obviously be outside. Look at our ancestors. You know, they weren't on computers and, and phones uh, inside office buildings. Like this human body is, is meant to be intimately connected with the cycles of light. And we certainly need water. It makes up about 70% of us. So these are some ideas. And, you know, Brian, I think you and I could talk for about an hour. And I know I'm so rambling at this point. I hope it has been helpful. So I want to pause for a sec, turn it over to you, because I know you have places you probably want to take this discussion. Well, there's so much there. The, uh, the, I definitely didn't want to interrupt because there's just value, value, I think, for people listening to even go back and check that out as you go along, because there's so much that we need to unpack. I'm curious, because you've talked kind of the behavioral psychology side versus, say, the nutrition and ingredient side, do you find from your experience, Anthony, the people that fall off? Because you mentioned the the derail where somebody will, you know, what I call, you know, press the fuck it button where they go, right, I'm done. Yeah. And, and they're just like, okay, weekend was off. And next thing you know, the whole week is gone and the whole month is gone. Do you find that from your experience of working with people, not necessarily in programs, but possibly in programs, that it's the behavioral psychology element around food and nutrition and the lack of systems and nutritional principles that holds people back versus, you know, an educational issue around food in general? It's everything. It's everything. It, like literally the, the, the nutrition is about consistent behaviors. I don't care how much you know about nutrition if you're putting French fries in your mouth four times a day. Like it's not, it's, it's about giving our body the fuel and the nutrients we, that, that are good for us. And that the good news is that good for us net is very wide. We can eat a whole bunch of different things and be incredibly healthy. There are people who ate, you know, a lot of like, and it depends on where people grew up. You look at cultures of people who like maybe Inuits, for example, I mean, they grew up in harsh conditions. They eat mostly like high fat and some protein, like ketogenic diets, if you will. And some of them uh, can live very healthy, long lives. And we have other people who eat completely plant-based diets and they can live long, healthy lives. But what both those people have in common is they have systems. They know what their healthy go-to foods are. They're getting them consistently in their bodies from some meal preparation. Uh, they're likely moving their bodies every single day. So it's all, it, I, I, I fair to say, you know, it's almost all behavioral psychology. And it's also um, giving someone a container so they can do their own self-experimentation. Because as you know from coaching people, when you start, you can give someone a framework and that's the starting point. But that ultimately that system needs to be dialed in for each individual person. So you try some recipes and you find out, man, maybe when I eat like sweet potatoes, I just feel really bloated afterwards. I don't know why. Okay, we, we, we tweak and, and then things become individualized. And when you get to the point of having a self-experimented individualized system, which only happens from being consistent for, let's just say, six months to a year or something where you're learning, you're getting positive results, positive feedback, you're starting to have more awareness around your system. That's what's going to keep you long term. Because if you need to open up a damn diet book to, to, to be able to stay on track and it's beholden to Dr. So-and-so's book or this kind of diet, 
you know you don't own it. It's it's borrowed and it doesn't fit you right because it wasn't made for you. So I, I suggest we make something for you. We start with some simple principles. We do some self-experimentation. You get you surrounded by a community of like-minded, positive people who are going to help you stay on track. And the good news is like with nutrition, and especially if you're in your middle age and you need to lose weight, you can lose a lot of weight very quickly. It's not uncommon for people who start some simple exercise, good hydration, cleaning up their sleep and to lose 20 pounds in the first month. You know, this, it, it's just because, you know, the body's releasing bloat. You're getting a couple pounds of poop out. You're certainly losing body fat. Uh, you know, all this water retention from all the highly processed foods is going away. So you can make a change really fast and you lose 20 pounds. You feel so, so much better. And then everything starts to positively snowball. This is going to sound like a bit of a loaded question. So I'm going to give you the preface to where it's coming from. It's about self-experimentation. But one of the things that I found recently on the podcast, more so in the last few months, is brackets of people who will listen to me speak about nutrition or they'll listen to you, Anthony, speak about nutrition or they'll listen to somebody. I'm very fortunate with the people I get to talk to. I can bring on people who are plant-based, people who are keto-based, people who are paleo, people who are carnivore and they all have their own schools of thought. As I said, one of the things I love about you and your content is about, well, what fits for you? And the reason I'm asking that question is I've had people who will listen to the podcast and then for that next week, that's all they're doing. They're like, okay, this is what I do. It's actually keto is what I'm meant to be doing. And I'm like, no, the message was lost there. It's about finding yes. what's going to be a good fit for you. From your experience, how important is self-experimentation with, for people? Well, I think self-experimentation is the only way you ever find out what works for you. Like you have to try it. And I think that we all have a, if we listen like internally, we all have like this internal desire for certain things that are unique to you and to me that kind of draw us to certain things. And when we're drawn to something, we can explore deeper into it. And so maybe someone listens to an episode you had of, of someone on carnivore and how they had, you know, they realized they're eating vegetables and having some autoimmune issues and they get rid of all this, these carbs and just do the high quality meats and they feel phenomenal. If, if that like it ignites something in someone who listens, then, you know, I think it, it's, it's to go for it, to try to experiment with the greatest understanding of all is that it has to fit into this overall system. Even if you were to choose to do the carnivore, you still need to do all the behavioral psychology stuff we just talked about. You need to have that morning routine. You need to have a standardized first meal. Maybe it's ribeye steak now instead of overnight oats, but like whatever it is, the same foundations that we applied, the behavioral habits and routines still apply. We're just changing out food sources. You know, and I, I will say this just because the purpose is, is not to take a stance on where it is, but I, I would I, I am a, I, I would say I'm more of a person who believes in a more balanced diet approach. Anyone who's removing there are some reasons for certain individuals with medical conditions to remove one of the main macronutrients, protein, carbs, fats. Like if you're going to take one of those out, you are limiting your diet in such a way that does throw out a lot of foods that are amazing. Um, and I know people are having more modified things, but like it'd be a shame if you couldn't have something like organic blueberries. You know, there's a lot of good health benefits to those and your gut bacteria love uh, the polyphenols and, and the fibers in those things. And they're, they're just good for your health, arterial health, all these things. Um, but also you can certainly get a lot of health benefits from like high quality wild caught seafood, like sardines, the omega threes, the calcium, like, you know, they're pretty clean relative to a marine source. So there's so many different things. And I, I like to say you got to find out what that combination is, but I'm more more concerned about helping you get the schedule than figuring out what those exact foods are. That's why I think the message is so positive that you promote, again, about finding what works for you. And I have a very similar approach when it comes to things like the carnivore diet or keto diet, like extreme diets for extreme cases. I'm like, if you have an autoimmune issue and the removal yeah. of certain foods is going to help that, then by all means, try it out and see if it fits. But what you said there, I think is really helpful for people. The gut check, you know, if was something said on a podcast, either this one or, you know, mm -hmm. something that you mentioned on the YouTube channel, that is a gut check where you're like, oh, I might try that out. You know, organic blueberries, maybe that will work well for me and you'll incorporate it into your nutrition. I think that's a good way to figure out what kind of self-experimentation you should be doing versus jumping on every single diet just because, you know, X, Y, or Z influencer said so. That's kind of one of my 
particular pet peeves when it comes to Instagram mm-hmm. and some of the content that's kind of given out there when it comes to nutrition. That's why I love the approach, the balanced approach of making whatever it is fit your lifestyle, your schedule with the nutritional systems. With that, and to kind of double back on what we were talking about, and you did touch on vitamin D and you touched on the getting outside for into the sunlight first thing in the morning to regulate your circadian rhythm. But mm-hmm. can you explain a little bit for people who aren't familiar with circadian rhythms, what that is, and then the impact of sleep when it comes to losing weight, building muscle, and just getting healthier in general? This is so amazing. And this is where, this is, and I'll just give a little preface in this. This is where after I started studying um, health, I became a more spiritual person because I started, and I'll say this, the reason I say this is because I, I started to see the, just the intimate connections between our bodies and all of nature. So what's amazing is that every cell and every immune cell has a vitamin D receptor. Like this is, we call it a vitamin and it's almost like you might dismiss it as something like vitamin C, which is very helpful, but people like, you know, everyone says, oh, it's vitamin C. I get those in my little emergency packets or I take vitamin C pills. Vitamin D is a different animal. Like it's a vitamin, but it's also truly a hormone and it regulates so many systems in your body. Main one being your immune system is, is, has huge roles in that. And right now, there's certainly a thing going around with the coronavirus, right? Everyone wants to maintain a high immune system. And we do know that high vitamin D status protects you um, in a lot of cases for a lot of things. Good idea to have vitamin D. Um, And when we're meant to get it through the sun, the sun is an interesting thing because I I live in a very sunny place in the United States, Arizona. It's the desert. And you learn very quickly that too much sun is bad for you. That UV exposure can damage your skin. It can absolutely give you cancer over time, but the right amount of sun, particularly in the morning when the sun's not too hot and getting some vitamin D is fantastic. Your sun, your skin is so incredible. It has cholesterol in your skin that can convert sunlight into an active sulfated form of vitamin D that goes throughout your body and does all sorts of amazing stuff. Bone health, immune health, um, just general vitality and energy in men, you correct vitamin D3 deficiency, testosterone levels naturally rise. And so many people are D3 deficient because we're not getting outside or because we live in certain places, like up in Ireland, you guys are so far north that you're not getting a lot of proper sunlight to get vitamin D3. And hey, we're we're spread all across the world, right? So we need to find solutions. So just knowing where you're located and how much sun you're actually getting, and you can also get your levels checked very easily with the blood test uh, by your doctor and see what your levels are. But for most people, correcting vitamin D is a thing. And so it's either taking some supplemental vitamin D3, which is very safe, it's even safe at very high doses, um, or, you can get sunshine. I would recommend both as much as you can. Um, and this is, this is like, I'm going to throw another extreme, but kind of funny example out there to show how important this is. We are meant to get vitamin D3 on our whole entire bodies. Like our ancient ancestors, like we we've, we've done a lot of technological and, and cultural progress over the last several thousand years, but the human mechanism has been around for a long time. We've been, we've been here and this is like ancient machinery in a modern world. And, and there was a time when we were naked outside and for the males in particular, you get sunshine, that full spectrum light on your testicles, it can raise testosterone levels. So it's, it's like, we're so connected to all of this, this, this cycle. And then, then at night when the sun goes down, this is the circadian rhythm part of this. So in the morning we have cortisol that naturally rises, helps get us energized and get up for the day. The sunshine in the eyes helps smooth that cortisol rhythm out. Cortisol lowers throughout the day. It's low at night and it speaks, it pikes, it speaks, uh, pikes up the next morning melatonin at night when our brain senses that light is going low our brain releases melatonin this is going to help be anti-inflammatory for the brain it's going to help relax us and unwind us it's going to take our brain from a very active beta wave state into these deeper brain wave states and that's essentially what sleep is it's it's the brain cycling through these deeper levels of of, of frequency of the of the brain's electrical activity and that's when we were dreaming in a certain state we're in deep sleep or we're not having any awareness of of anything we're just kind of like just there in this kind of like blissful thing. We wake up and we're like, ah, that was nice. So this cycle happens every single day and our our hormones are tied to this. Our appetite hormones are tied to this. Our energy producing hormones are tied to this. And we know what happens is when we don't sleep well, we disrupt the circadian rhythm. So we don't get enough sleep or waking up at erratic times. Or even if we're working, like uh, we have a shift work where we're actually just working at night and sleeping during the day, all of this negatively impacts health. It increases risk for cancer, it increases risk for heart disease. It, it causes us to have energy and fatigue. It's associated with depression. So there's there's so many things that go wrong if we get this uh, this missing sleep. So for example, you miss a night of sleep, the next day your body is, it becomes more insulin resistant. So you're just not gonna process carbs as well. And your hunger hormone ghrelin is higher, it spikes. And your cortisol actually might be higher too. So this is a perfect storm for like not doing well. You're insulin resistant, you're hungry, and you have high cortisol. 
So like not a good scenario, right? But this is what happens a lot of time when people don't prioritize sleep. You have this hormonal cascade that's making it harder for you to feel good. And when you're not feeling good, it's easy to turn to a quick sugary fix or a soda, or you get a bunch of coffees to prop yourself up. And then that coffee gets you hyped up to get the donut. And then you say, fuck it. And then you're down the, the you hit the button and then you're down the rabbit hole again. This cycle happens to people almost every single day and we can break it. Um, again, but a big part of that help happens with this circadian hygiene. It's just like a part of good health. Um, in fact, I would say it's, it's like if you're not sleeping well, but you're spending a lot of time doing vigorous exercise, that's probably worse for your body than if you were to get your nutrition right and make sure you're getting really quality restorative sleep. Like our bodies don't need that much high intensity exercise as we age. It is helpful for maintaining muscle mass and for helping our mitochondria regenerate. And, and it's very good, but low intensity exercise, walking, Good sleep, good nutrition is plenty fine for a long and happy life. If you want your body to look a certain way and you want to perform, you will need to do high intensity stuff. But the point is, if you're missing your sleep and your nutrition is only like B grade based on what you think it could be, and then you're doing high intensity exercise and propping yourself on, up on stimulants on top of that, that is not supportive of your health, in, in my opinion, and experience of the research and, and working with thousands of clients. I apologize for this follow-up question in advance, but there's everybody that's listening to the podcast, 80 to 90% of people, when we talk about sleep, the follow-up in their mind is always, well, how much sleep do I need? And I apologize in advance because I know it's a Pandora's box. But for people who ask you that question, how do you normally respond? Uh, Here's the deal. I mean, I I think... I'm not a full sleep expert. I'll give you my take on it, but there are people who study this for a living who can give probably deeper answers. One, I know it's variable based on person. Some people need more sleep than others, and you tend to need a little less sleep as you age, so that's a thing. Two, I would say that you wake up feeling refreshed is probably the best gauge. Like, there's a thing called short-term sleep debt, and there's a thing called long-term sleep debt, and they're different, and and these are studied by some researchers. Um, I have a friend at Harvard who's a Harvard sleep researcher, and she she was teaching me about this, and basically short-term sleep debt we mess up sleep during the week. We, we had to stay up really late for work or we partied with the boys or whatever happened, you know, you know, then, you know, you have short-term sleep debt that can be repaid during a week. Long-term sleep debt is basically you've had a bad circadian rhythm for like such a long time and you just have been missing sleep and you know, you could be sleeping more. Um, that could take research say months to months to recover, um, of, of actually getting more sleep and really sleeping in and really taking like these, the sleep vacations as they call them. And maybe some of the damage might even be permanent. So like this is serious stuff. It really does damage damage you, and 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 it also for people who are concerned about aesthetics, it damages your skin to get low sleep too. You know the cortisol that gets raised raised all the time and, and out of control when the cortisol rhythm's not right when you're not sleeping well. It breaks some of the collagen cross linkages in your in your uh, in your skin, and it's just not great, right? Seven hours, six six to nine, six to nine hours. I mean, it's tough to give a right range. I mean, for athletes who are super high intensity, I mean. Like, like Michael Phelps training for the Olympics. I don't know. Maybe he slept as much as he possibly could, like it, until he woke up naturally. I mean, the more you train, the harder you train, the more sleep your body's going to need. I would say if you feel like you're in a cycle right now where you need stimulants like coffee to get yourself going in the morning uh, and you know your bedtime and routine's not as consistent, you know, you're probably not doing great. If I had to, if you told me, Anthony, damn it, pick one number, like stop r- circling around, I would say shoot for seven hours seven and a half hours. Sleep cycles around 90 minutes. Ideally, you can wake up, you know, uh, in, in, during a light sleep phase. And certainly there's gizmos and gadgets like these aura rings or whoops or whatever people are wearing now that it, it can help give you a lot of insight into how much your body actually needs by actually testing stuff like heart rate variability, what's your morning blood, uh, blood, blood pressure and what's your morning pulse. Um, this is a useful trick is actually like one thing you can do is, is if you're on vacation or you're knowing you're in a pretty relaxed stage of life, you can start taking your morning heart rate which is a good indication of how stressed your nervous system is. And, it, and you'll find what your baseline is. And if you find that your heart rate is consistently higher than that for a period of time, you're not getting enough sleep. Your nervous system is just a little too taxed. You're in sympathetic dominance at that point, and you could use some more sleep. And the stimulants also play another factor here because it's not just how much you're sleeping. It's like, what other stimulants are you taking on top of that? And this is where the whole uh, cycle comes there. Yeah, it's a very, and I really appreciate that answer because I know when it comes to sleep, it's a Pandora's box of, as you said, individual variability based on the person. And this may seem like a peculiar segue, but one of the things that I've changed my mind about in recent years that I wish I had known earlier was the importance of sleep. Like I was always a, you know, nutrition first, 
trainer even when I before I qualified 10 years ago I was you know my own fitness principle was nutrition first training second and then down the line sleep supplements all these other things whereas in recent years the last five six years I now have sleep up there probably alongside nutrition like yeah. it, it's a it's a coin flip they're which tied one's, number one they're tied yeah. number one they're so important but I'm curious Anthony that was something that I wish I had known when I started off first. Is there anything when you started your journey first, more so 10 years ago, when you kind of got de- heavy into the kind of the Fit Father Project, the Fit Mother Project, or just the fitness side in general and health side in general, is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known when you started off when it comes to the realm of health or fitness? Yeah, totally. I would say I, I'll really answer this from the advantage of of bodybuilding because when I was doing, when I got into bodybuilding, I was following nutrition relative to bodybuilding. It was much different than the nutrition I know to be more true for long-term health. I would say when it comes to nutrition, it really comes down to di- getting the getting the right kinds of broad spectrum nutrients, but broadly speaking, digestive health. It's like finding foods that work really well with your digestive system, that keep your GI tract healthy, that have good probiotic and prebiotic sources. Like this is just more, <laughs> we're learning how important gut function is all your, your, your gut microbiome, how it influences your immune system, neurotransmitter production. Even, even if you're lean or you're not lean, they, they do fecal transplants from lean people into obese people. So they take poop from lean people and they put it into uh, obese people. And when those different gut microbiome colonies like take hold, obese people lose weight. They've done this in rats or doing it in humans now. Fecal transplants are things you can actually go and Google and find a place in your area. But it's it's that important, these gut microbiomes. So it's almost like we we tend to have, because we have a kind of reductionistic way of looking at things a lot, we tend to think of ourselves as just these bodies and not this connected ecosystem of all these microbes that we we coexist with. So feeding them is like a top priority for a healthy body, which, hey, the good news is it comes down to giving them some fruits and vegetables that fit well for you and that you enjoy. So the cool news is like the same nutrition advice applies the, the basics that we've heard for years, the stuff your great grandma might've told you that, that she would have known. Uh, it's just now we understand why in a deeper way. And I think that gives me a deeper emotional connection to why I want to do these things because it's just that important. I love it. And to kind of, we've touched on nutrition, we've touched on kind of exercise and training a little bit. We've touched on sleep. The kind of last thing I think of when it comes to that pyramid of overall body compositional change or health in any individual, whether you're 25, 35, 45, 55, I think of stress. And we've mentioned mm-hmm. cortisol a couple of times. Talk about what stress does to you. So we have, we've talked about the nervous system a little bit, right? It, the human body is amazing. We have this central spinal axis, we have the brain and the nervous system, the central nervous system runs through that spinal cord, out through all these nerves, innervating all of our organs and our muscles. And the nervous system has different modes. It has a mode where it needs to gear up to like get shit done, to fight the tiger, to go play the sport or to do a very stressful short-term situation. And it's good that the body can amp up. You know, that adrenaline gives the mom the strength to lift the car off her kid, like that kind of stuff, sympathetic dominance. But for the most part, for human health, we're meant to be in a relaxed state parasympathetic, rest and digest, low heart rate, not, and, and the mind is not as active. The body is, is not tensed. This is kind of uh, the, the other base state that we should look to achieve. The problem is with modern life, based on a whole host of factors we've talked about and some other we can talk about now, people are living in a sympathetic dominant state. We are stressed because of psychological factors, because, um, you know, there could be stuff happening in our families with our finances and our lives. Maybe we're holding on to, you know, a bunch of mental dramas or patterns or or habits. Maybe we've created bad situations for ourselves from past actions. Any of these things, you know, we're also, we're not just physical beings. We're we're mental, emotional, spiritual beings too, in the sense that we have this life experience that we're kind of co-creating based on all this. So this is affecting our minds and it's dynamically causing our bodies to release cortisol. And cortisol is great because it gets you energized in the morning. It's meant to rise in the morning. But when cortisol stays elevated all day, Uh, that's when it creates problems of constantly elevated blood pressure. It can create insulin resistance in time. The body has blood sugar uh, flowing around all the time, which is glycating red blood cells, leading to prediabetes stuff over time. It's going to promote weight gain and and central adiposity over time. And then this kind of snowball effect happens. So how do we battle stress? Well, I think it has to be a multi-pronged approach. One is give your body its best natural stress reliever, which is sleep. The chance that your mind turns off automatically every time you go into deep sleep. So 
getting that and prioritizing that. So things we can take before bed to help optimize sleep, whether it's a little melatonin, whether it's some magnesium, whether it's L-theanine, some of these things can help improve our sleep quality. And I think those are valuable things to, to discuss, but whatever it takes, ideally that's not drugs or alcohol, um, to help improve sleep is going to reduce stress, which is good. The other thing that reduces stress is time outside in nature and getting some sunshine. The vitamin D is going to help breathing through your nose is going to help. I know this sounds so foundational, but like we're in the fitness industry and, and no one's really talking enough about, well, some people are, but more of us need to talk about how important like breathing is like breathing properly through your nose. When you breathe through your nose in a relaxed manner, it puts your nervous system into a relaxed parasympathetic state. The oxygen that comes through your nose uh, releases nitric oxide in the bloodstream that, vi that dilates your blood vessels, reduces your blood pressure, improves your circulation. And then the brain is very synced to the breath. And, and when the, the breath starts to get very calm, the mind gets calm too. This is also why when you see someone have a panic attack, they, they hyperventilate. The breath becomes very short, shallow, and rapid when they're blowing off a lot of CO2. So the breath and the mind are very tied. So I think any strategy to reduce stress has to ultimately come down to keeping the body in a more relaxed state throughout the day. You're working on having a deeper, more peaceful, present breathing, perhaps practicing things like uh, meditation, you know, is, is phenomenally helpful for this. But even something like taking that morning walk in the sun where you're just breathing through your nose for a few minutes is a great way to set the tone of the nervous system to make it really healthy. Uh, the honest answer that not a lot of people are going to want to hear here is probably taking a, a, a tolerance break or a break from your stimulants for a little while. If you're serious about your stress. One of the not good ideas is just to toss more stimulants on top of the system it, in taking a break from that. So switching your coffee out for a little bit to some lowly caffeinated green tea. Green tea has that L-theanine amino acid that's naturally calming on the mind. And it, it's, it's very well studied and it does decrease stress and anxiety and, and mental chatter. So these are some ideas. And then, of course, the, the cool thing is as you get healthier, your body becomes more resilient to stress. As you exercise more, your body becomes more resilient to stress. It's antioxidant capacity increases. Your mitochondria increase in number and density and function. And, and you're, you have positive outlook. You get endorphins and keflins are released from, which are natural opioids. <laughs> so you feel great. So exercise can help boost you up um, in time. So it can kind of become your armor. And that's how you, it's, it's, it's complex. You can dig out of this hole. And I, I suppose for someone who's listening to this right now, a good thing to think about was, was there any of those areas that we feel like there's gaps? Like, are there areas and doing that self-reflection will able you to figure out where do I need to lean in and work on which one of those areas do I have gaps in or, or what, what, what the, where was the gut check there if there was one, but it's, it's so important. And I, I think another thing we are social, we're social creatures. So one thing that helps with stress is being able to just vent it out and be with like-minded people. I can firmly say our fit father and fit mother programs would not be nearly as successful as they are if it was just like in isolation, like a PDF or a workout or a video you got, like we have people in communities with thousands of other members. And then like that itself is, is kind of cathartic. You can, you know, vent when you screwed up or you can post some accountability and you can blow off some steam and you feel like you have support. So I don't think that can be overstated. Groups of like-minded people increase serotonin, which can help you feel better and more connected. So that's all good stuff. It, that was definitely the thing that jumped out at me when I was thinking about sending people your way, as I said, but that are better fits because you're serving them better than what my program does or what other coaches do. It's the community aspect. Like, I love that. I think, as you said, that is the thing that brings people in, especially from the stress level, but Overall, just the accountability side of it, the um, learning off other people, bouncing ideas, how you're feeling, all of these things all contribute. They're kind of the intangibles to weight loss or muscle building that people don't talk about. As you mentioned earlier, the nutrition side of ingredients versus behavioral psychology. It's like, look at the social element of your health or fitness goal versus just, I need to get to the gym five times per week. There's a holistic approach that tends to serve people better when you make it adapt to your lifestyle and make it work in a a holistic way with the accountability, the community, the behavioral psychology element, looking at stress, looking at sleep, looking at everything and then doing a gut check based on what jumped out today. So like a call to action for people, I think, Anthony, is, well, you know, what part of today's podcast jumped out? Mm -hmm. Was it the nutrition? Was it the behavioral psychology side? Was it the stress? Was it the sleep, the circadian rhythm? Was it the training element, training too much, training too little, you know, not realizing that you can get your body compositional change by moving more? All of these things are worth checking in on because they're the things that can potentially successfully set people up on their fitness journey. And I just got one more question, Anthony, because you have an amazing message as we've, you know, unpacked some of it today. And for anyone that's not following the YouTube channels, I'll link them in the show notes. Go follow both, you know, whichever one you fall into the bracket, busy mums, busy fathers, check out the Instagram page. I'll link all of those. But my question to you, Anthony, the final one is, 
you put out a lot of content online. And when it comes to health and fitness, probably the most dominant platform online is Instagram or YouTube. But in the case of this question, because I want something that's going to be kind of a billboard based or a kind of a written message, if you had access to everybody on Instagram who's into health, who's into fitness, who's into just their overall well being, and you could promote one message to them, what would you say to everybody if you had that access to the entire Instagram feed of people who, yeah, you could potentially touch on or talk to? Well, that's a hell of a question. I mean, wow. I, I'll, I'll share what comes to mind. I suppose when I look around and I talk about health a lot, it's very easy to think about the physical body. And these physical bodies are great, but no matter how much we eat well and we exercise well, by their nature, we, these bodies will deteriorate and we will die. And so I think that's important to keep in perspective. It's not my morbid message to the world. I'm getting to a to deeper point here. But I think the things that will really move us forward, if I could talk to everyone, would somehow be to spread a message of love and connection right now. Because even within this industry of people who are clearly sharing the value of health and well-being, there is so much fighting. There is so much focusing on the wrong kinds of things. Like imagine, I was thinking, how could the world actually change? I think the world could actually change if we could change everyone's consciousness, everyone's mindset to be one of loving and connected and supporting. And that would be like waving a magic wand because ultimately if if people felt that way, if people felt loved, supported, loving, connected, then we would all support each other. We'd all help each other. We'd figure things out. We wouldn't silo into these these camps and war against each other. It would would just be all productive. Um, And so I think those are the most important things to focus on beyond health because I know a lot of people with six packs who are unhappy, who have bad marriages, who, who just aren't loving their life. And I think there's a deeper cut to this. And in my experiences, the deeper cut comes down to feeling to, to experiencing on some level that we are all one, we're all connected and that we're one big family and, and kind of just working on aligning our actions and sharing that love with one another. I love that. What an incredible way to finish. Dr. Balduzzi, Anthony, I've loved this conversation. There is just knowledge bombs left, right and center here for everybody listening. Can you let them know is the best place for them to follow you for those who think you're going to be a good fit or your program is going to be a good fit for them? Any of those links that you want to give now, give them and I'll link them in the show notes and the description for anybody to click straight on through Um, and really looking forward to having people check it out um, and the feedback from today's podcast. But any links you want to give, give them now and anybody listening, you can click straight on through to them. Yeah, so... Our sites are fitfatherproject.com and fitmotherproject.com. You can even Google Fit Father Project or Fit Mother Project too. That'll take you to our websites where we have free meal plan, free workout. You can see some of our amazing case studies. You can see our shop with our supplements and all of our cool stuff there. Like that, that's like the main sites. The other good places you mentioned is our YouTube channels. So if you're on YouTube, you enjoy watching YouTube videos, you can go to Fit Father Project on YouTube or Fit Mother Project. Just type it in. I think we have over like close to 600, 700 videos on there, just on covering all wide of topics. So I'd recommend you go to the channel, search something, um, or just see our popular videos. And I think you'll really enjoy those. So YouTube or our websites. And on the website, there's also forms to contact me and our team if you want to chat more. And for everybody listening, I will link those in the show notes, especially recommend the YouTube channel as someone that did a massive deep dive into it in the lead up to today's podcast. There is just so much value on there. Um, But go check out everything we've linked or everything that Anthony has linked. I will put it in the show notes. Anthony, thank you so much again for your time, for your message, for everything that you do for everybody out there. I have absolutely loved this conversation. Thank you, Brian. Me too. I really did. There you have it, Dr. Anthony Balduzzi on behavioral psychology around food, nutrition principles, and how poor sleep or too much stress negatively impacts fat loss. As I said at the top of the episode, hopefully you had a pen and a piece of paper or the notepads on your phone because there was just knowledge bombs left, right, and center in today's episode. We covered a wide range of topics when it comes to body compositional change from the nutrition side to the stress, sleep, and training element. So hopefully you enjoyed today's podcast as much as I enjoyed recording it. If you did, be sure to hit me up on Instagram let me know what you thought take a screenshot you can tag me and you can tag anthony on his instagram page which is the fit father project on instagram and if it's your first time listening hit that follow hit that subscribe button for episodes coming every single monday that's all from this week catch you all next monday 